Seth, we're here at this FQXI conference, your second, I think, it's my fourth. Uh, and the topic is a different one than we've covered in the past. It's the physics of the observer. And um, as I look at that question, it was something that was in the early days of quantum mechanics, almost uh, maybe a century ago, and some people talked about the observer. Uh, why after a century in quantum mechanics are we still talking about the physics of the observer? Well, Robert, I think it's because we still don't understand how quantum mechanics works and gives us the macroscopic world that we see around us. Um, the idea of an observer was first put forward by the pioneers in quantum mechanics like Niels Bohr to help us understand why in quantum mechanics we actually see things happening. In quantum mechanics, you know, an electron can be here and there at the same time. This mm -hmm. is kind of weird. And uh, uh, Bohr invoked the observer to say, okay, an electron shows up here or there, or just in one place when it's observed to be there. But then what does it mean to be an observer? And, yeah. um, <clears throat> you know, is an observer a, uh, a measurement apparatus? Is an observer a human being? What does it take to be an actual observer? Well, it would seem absurd if, if it, the requirement was, is for a human being or a sentient creature, because certainly there were quantum mechanical things going on in the early universe. We talk about that a lot. And I don't think there were human beings around then. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. And so that's like, you know, it does seem, seem uh, very strange to invoke human beings for this when, you know, stuff has been happening for billions of years without anybody to see it. So what's the current controversy? I mean, when we have topics, when we talk about it, FQXI, and we talked about time, we talked about information, we talked about a multiverse. I mean, there are different sides of, that, of, of those issues. People have different, you know, time is either real or it's not real. Or, so we, we, can, we can discuss those. Information is really important, as you may say, and I may say, well, it's just sort of a metaphor to talk about stuff. So those are real issues. So what's the real issue about uh, an observer? Well, <clears throat> as you're saying, you know, we don't want to actually have to have human beings around in order for things to happen. I mean, <laughs> you know, we want trees to be able to fall on the <laughs> forest and make some noise, right, even right. if nobody's there right. to uh, <laughs> listen to it. Um, the uh, current consensus, I'd say, though it's calling it a consensus is perhaps a little too much because not everybody agrees with it, is that um, <clears throat> there's a process called decoherence. So in quantum mechanics, you have this wave nature of quantum mechanics. So here's a wave corresponding to electron here mm -hmm. and there at the same time. But when this electron interacts with its environment, the environment gets information about the electron. And in, the, uh, in one part of the environment, it will find the electron over here. Another part, it will find it over there. And the result decoheres this wave. So the wave rather being here and there at the same time now becomes here or there at the same time. So a good way of describing how things happen or become classical is to describe how they interact with their surroundings and then decohere. Define precisely decoherence. Yeah, so a wave is coherent if it can be added up in a way where you, you can uh, detect the phase between the waves. So I could have a wave that goes like that, or I could have a wave that goes like that. Mm -hmm. Now, um, here, this part of the wave is negative. In the other part, this part positive. of the wave is positive. So in quantum mechanics, the, the probability of finding something here is proportional to the amplitude of the wave, but to the amplitude squared. Yeah, so rather, it doesn't <clears throat> care whether it's positive, positive or, or negative. negative right. right. So um, if, you, if you're going to find it here or there, mm -hmm then here or there doesn't care about whether this amplitude is negative or, or whether this amplitude is positive. But in the dynamics of a wave, right, you know, it makes a lot of difference if this amplitude mm -hmm. is negative or this amplitude is positive. For instance, if this is negative and this is positive, these move on top of each other, they cancel, cancel each out. other out. This is called destructive interference. So in quantum mechanics, all the time, you get situations where this amplitude makes a difference. Somehow, and in measurement, after you make measurement or in decoherence, it doesn't make a difference any longer. Okay. So you could say decoherence is a process where the, uh, whether the amplitude is positive or negative no longer makes a difference. And interaction with the environment will have that effect. Okay. All right. So what are current controversies? I mean, here at the conference, I mean, who, who, who is saying what, uh, or at least what the positions are on different sides? Well, uh, uh, first of all, not everybody agrees with what I just said, though, I mean, there is a, a large fraction of the physics community agrees with this. It doesn't necessarily... What's, uh, the, what's the alternative view? Uh, well, um, 
I don't know because I don't understand the alternative views. But it, first of all, this doesn't necessarily entirely resolve this kind of measurement problem of quantum mechanics right. because, you know, you still have the environment is, you know, you have a, in the quantum state of the system, you start out with electron here and there at the same time and the environment comes in and it the environment and the electron go into a state where electron is over here, environment detects it being over here, electron is over there, environment detects it over there. Those two pieces are still there in the quantum description of the system. Sure. So you're still in this kind of funny, what's called the many worlds uh, theory picture of, of quantum mechanics. So the many, the many worlds theory, uh, it seems to me to be a very uh, extreme way of of, of dealing with this problem, that it's not a question of which one it is, it's a question of everything happening. But if you, if you look at the uh, moments when you have interactions in, in the quantum world, it is you know, 10 to the 30th to the 40th per second per, in, per, per situation, then you multiply it by the, the conjoint probabilities of the, of the whole universe, and it, the numbers become just absurd. Right, and, and you know, this, it does explain it very well. So for instance, why, you know, I, I'm bigger than an electron, a lot bigger than an electron, <laughs> and we don't see human beings being here and there at the same time. Why not? Well, so it would be possible for the, my wave function to be here and there at the same time. But because, you know, as you were saying, Avogadro's number of photons are bouncing off of me all the time, <laughs> It only takes one photon bouncing off of me to make me be either here or there. And I've got Avogadro's number doing it. So and, there's no, and no it's chance. And the conjoined uh, the probability of all of those things, all those uh, quantum effects uh, together. Yeah, that's right. So, so I'm never going to behave as if I'm here and there at the same time. Now, my thoughts might be vague and fuzzy, and I may not be able to come down on one side or the other, but that's not a quantum mechanical right, effect. Right. Uh, why, why did uh, Richard uh, uh, Feynman uh, in famously say, everybody who thinks they understand quantum mechanics proves by that statement that they really don't? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I think this is a version of Niels Bohr's uh, uh, expression where he said, anybody who, who can contemplate quantum mechanics without getting dizzy <laughs> hasn't properly understood it. <laughs> yeah, it's just basically strange and counterintuitive. That's just the way it is. I mean, you just got to suck it up. You know? <laughs> Uh, so, w what kind of progress can be made? I mean, at this conference, w what progress is being made? So, um, uh, actually, people, by and large, accept this notion that that you know that things become classical by interacting with their environment. But then, of course, there's a question of what is thing and what is environment. The separation between thing and environment is kind of arbitrary. Like for me, I mean, you know, I separate myself from my surroundings by my skin. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, then I, my immediate environment is my clothes. And then there's this beautiful, cool air <laughs> and this guy, beautiful river behind us and the sunshine coming mm -hmm. down. So, you know, I, I have a pretty good idea of what my environment is. Mm -hmm. And if you have an electron, which is a particle, then the electron is the electron. And its environment is in the environment. But in, in the universe as whole, it's not so obvious. I mean, the universe as whole, you have these quantum fields. They are maybe in one place or another. It's not clear who's, mm. which environment is which. <laughs> and then how you describe what happens in terms of, you know, something getting information about something else depends on what the thing and the something else is. So, you know, is this the thing and is this the environment? Mm -hmm. Or is this the thing and is this the environment? That's kind of arbitrary. So people are kind of protesting at this conference. <laughs> we don't have a good way of making this split. 